Good morning. Welcome to Monday Manna. This is Gwen Moliette of Proclaiming His Word Ministry. I'm so glad that you're going to receive this teaching this morning. It has been life changing in my personal walk with the Lord. Uh, the title of what I want to talk about today is The Power of Forgiveness. I'm very aware that we've heard literally hundreds of sermons on forgiveness, but I don't know that you've heard one quite like this. What the Lord showed me is three reasons why I have to forgive and then three ways how to do it. Um, I know people tell you, just let it go, forgive them, uh, pardon it, look over it. But boy, when you're wounded or hurt, it's not that easy. There's no cliche. And so let's pray. You might want to grab a pen and a paper for notes. I'm doing three reasons why we must forgive and then three ways to forgive. Father, I thank you this morning that your word is anointed, it's powerful, it's life-changing. Lord, change us today. If there's anyone, God, that we have unforgiveness towards, bitterness, anger, resentment, you know our hearts and you're the only one that can change our hearts. And I pray that you take out, as Ezekiel said, the stony heart, put a tender heart of flesh. Lord, may this impact us and may this be a tool we use. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I have a friend, she recently went to heaven, but one of my dearest friends, Dr. Eve Fenton, and I remember her telling me one time, uh, we were talking about forgiveness and unforgiveness, and she said, Gwen, forgiveness is a heavenly tool for an earthly problem, and that is so true. And so I'm going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 15. Remember, I'm going to make three reasons why we need to forgive. And so I want to start in Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 18. I said Matthew 15. So good. I got my mistake made. I can move on. Matthew 18. And I want to read starting at verse 15. Three reasons why we have to forgive. And I'll give you the number one after I read the scripture. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Verse 16. If he will not hear you, take with thee one or two, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word can be established. If he neglect to hear you, then you tell the church. Uh, let him, if he neglects to hear the church, let him be as a heathen or a publican. Verse 18. Verily I say to you, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it'll be done of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. What's, this is such a powerful portion of scripture. First off, it says in verse 15, if your brother trespass, I'd like to cross the word if out and just put when, because you're going to get offended. We're going to be, uh, we're going to have opportunities daily to forgive people. So he said, when your brother forgives you. Now, sometimes it would help us to follow directions. This portion of scripture tells us exactly how to recover a broken relationship, how to release an offense Few of us do it, but we've all read it. It says, if and when your brother sins against you, go to him alone. Try to save the relationship. Try to heal the offense. Try to come to some conclusion, some reconciliation. Go to him alone. We don't do that. We go to everyone else but the brother that offended us, and we go in the name of a prayer request. So let's say that Mary sinned against me. Instead of going to Mary one-on-one, -on -one, saying, Mary, let's try to resolve this. I go to Jan Jan Janice. I'm just trying to pick a J name. I go to Janice. And I say, Janice, we need to pray. Mary hurt me. Mary did this, that, and the other. Well, what's happened is when Janice sees Mary, I've split the brethren, which doesn't make God very happy. And, um, and so I need to follow the direction. We need to do it the way it's written. You just go to Mary yourself. Now, let's say I go to Mary. Mary feels she's right. I feel I'm right. Neither one of us are going to give an inch. Then you would go in verse 16 and you would bring a witness. Now, what a witness is, is not your best friend that's heard your side, that is out with you to get Mary back. No, a witness is someone who doesn't know anything. She's just going to witness your 
encounter with each other. Because how many of you know, when you're offended, when I'm offended, sometimes my voice can get raised, my body language, I can cross my arms and roll my eyes, and I'm not really there to reconcile, I'm there to get you. So a witness is going to be one that's going to say, now Gwen, how did you mean that? Mary, what did you hear her say? Do you understand? So the way to do it, number one, is to go one-on-one by yourself to gain the brother back. That's what verse 15 says, to gain your brother, not to crucify him, but to gain him back. You go to win them back. If you can't reconcile, which can happen, look at Barnabas and Saul, it can happen. Then in verse 16, you take one or two witnesses trying to help them and help you reconcile. If that fails, then in verse 17, you involve your pastor, your leadership, you would ask for counsel, you would try to sit down and, and rectify this and see if the pastors couldn't help you. But verse 18 is point number one, why I want to be quick to forgive. If I don't forgive you, I bind myself to you. If I forgive you, I loose myself from you. So the first reason that it's imperative that we learn to forgive is binding and loosing. Now, we've heard Matthew 18, 18 taken out of text millions of times. We're binding devils. We're loosing the Holy Spirit. That's not a bad thing. But you need to look at this verse in its setting. And in its setting, this is talking about forgiveness and unforgiveness. What the Bible is saying is that when I don't forgive you, I bind myself to you. When I release you, I loose myself from you. I don't know about you. I don't want to bind myself to people that hurt me. I don't want to be bound to memories. I don't want to be bound to an event. I don't want to see you. And the moment I see you, it comes flooding back like it happened yesterday. I don't want to be bound to you. I want to be loosed from you. So binding and loosing. Forgiveness looses us. Unforgiveness binds us. And if you look at verse 20, because this is another one of those verses we've really taken out of setting. Jesus is saying, where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst. We use this when the attendance is low at church or there's a snowstorm. Oh, we're two or three are gathered. And that's fine. But what Jesus is talking about in this verse is the two or three that are trying to rectify. Mary and me and the witness. When the three of us or the four of us get together, the Lord is in the middle to try to reconcile this for us because he's a God of peace. The Lord is uh, against division and strife. He wants peace and unity. So number one, my question is, do you want to be bound to that event, bound to that person, bound to that memory, or do you want to be loosed from them? I choose being loosed. And the way I do it is by forgiving them. So number one, binding and loosing. Let's take a look at number two. It's right here in this chapter. I'm going to read a lot of scripture, um, but it's very important that you get the text. So here's point one. Do you want to be bound or do you want to be loosed? Point two, I'll give it to you ahead of time. Do you want to be tormented? And unforgiveness will torment us and the devil will see to it. So here's the story. We're picking it up now. Jesus is in red talking about forgiveness, binding and loosing. Now Peter comes in Matthew 18, 21. Then comes Peter and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? Up to seven times. Well, Peter gets it. <laughs> I mean, verse 15 says, if he sins. Verse 21 says, when he sins, how many times do I have to forgive him? And I think seven is very generous. He goes, Lord, how about if I forgive him seven times? That's a lot. I think that's extremely generous. And seven is the number of God's completion. Eight is the number of resurrection, new beginning. I say, you go, Peter, seven times. That's awesome. But Jesus really answers him in a way that pins all of us to the wall. In verse 22, Jesus said, I say unto thee, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, in case you know or don't know your math, seven times 70 is 490. So does that mean I start a chart in my kitchen with my husband? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And when I get to 489, I can let him have it. No. What this means is we're not to keep any account. No records of wrong it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. said it hardly notices when a wrong's been done. It keeps no record. Oh, I'm a great bookkeeper. Ask my husband. Um, women seem to have an ability to hold on 
my, I have found in my life with my son, my grandsons, my husband, men seem to be a little easier at letting it go. They don't bring it back up again. It's as if something happens with a woman. When you hurt her, she it's like sealed and she remembers it. And we don't want that. We want to be able to release that. So Jesus, when he said seven times 70, doesn't mean you keep a record. He means you endlessly keep forgiving them, just like God endlessly keeps forgiving us. So here's the story. Verse 23. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king that would take account of his servants. And he uh, brought one to him which owed him 10,000 talents. I'm going to tell you the story, I think, and and so because I'd like to get this entire teaching on today's Monday Manna. And I think if I read all of these verses, I'm going to not have the time to get to the three ways to forgive. It's every bit as important as three. Why do I want to forgive? Number one, so I'm not bound to you. Number two, so I'm not tormented. So here's the story. Let me modernize it. A guy, uh, a guy comes to me and he says, I need a loan. I said, oh, I'm going to lend you $3 million. I'm going to give you five years to pay back. At the end of the five years, he comes and he says, oh, Gwen, please have patience with me. Forgive me. I don't have the millions of dollars you lent me. And I say, you know what? You're loose to your debt. You don't even have to pay me back. And I want to make sure you see the language of the Bible here. Um, it talks actually about loosing him from his debt. Uh, so in verse 27, then the Lord said to the servant who was moved with compassion, I loose him and I forgive the debt. Interesting. I loose you and I forgive the debt. Well, the guy that's been forgiven of the millions of dollars of debt that I just released goes out and finds somebody that owes him $10. And he says, give me my $10. And they say, we don't have the $10. And instead of forgiving him the little debt after he was forgiven the huge debt, the Bible said he actually grabbed him by the throat, got violent, began to choke him, said, you're going to pay me every bit of my $10 and I'm going to sell your wife and kids and put you all in prison if you don't pay me back. Well, you see the scenario. We have a large debt forgiven. We have a minor debt held to the account. Well, the word gets back to me. Now, remember, I'm the one that forgave him the millions of dollars. The word gets back to me, how he treated his fellow servant over a $10 bill. I'm enraged. And so we're going to go back in scripture and look at verse 29. So I called the guy to me that choked the other man for 10 bucks. Verse 29. And he fell down at his feet saying, have patience and I'll pay you all. But he would not. Oh, this is the guy that, uh, that I want to, let me slow down. I shouldn't have read 29. That's the guy that wouldn't release the forgiveness to the other man. And uh, so if you look at verse, let's see where we want. Verse uh, 31, the fellow servants come and they tell me what's happened. 32, uh, then the Lord called him, that would be me calling him and say, I forgave you this huge debt. You couldn't forgive this tiny little debt. Here it is, verse 33 and 34. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you and the pity on thee? And the Lord was wrought, angry, furious, delivered him till the tormentors, till he should pay back everything you owe. Now you will never hear verse thirty-five quoted uh, at a testimonial. Verse 35, so likewise will my heavenly father do to each one of you if you do not from your heart forgive your brother their trespass. Let me read it to you. And the Lord was wrought and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also to you. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. Can you imagine this? Maybe I can get it. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to keep going until somebody says, God bless you. So likewise will my heavenly father do to you, if everyone from your heart, you forgive not your brother. So here it is, point number two. If I don't forgive, I am turned over to the tormentors. The person that offended me, the person that hurt me, they go about their everyday life. I'm the one that every time I see them, I want to choke them out. Every time I remember the event, I have all that emotions of pain and hurt and anger. It's not worth it. It shortens our life. It makes us sick. Unforgiveness is terrible. I don't want to be bound to you. Number one. Number two, I don't want the enemy to torment me. And if you will look again, at verse 34, he is turned over to the tormentors. 
Verse 35, Jesus said, this is how my father will do to you if you don't forgive. I don't want to be tormented. Number three is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you've not seen this, it is a powerful, powerful scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The third reason we absolutely have to forgive is if I don't forgive you, I have given Satan the advantage over me. Please wake up. I hope you see this. I hope God touches your spirit, heart, soul, mind, and body, and that you'll never look at unforgiveness again. It's something we cannot afford. We can't afford to be bound to that person. We can't afford for the Lord to have to turn us over to the tormentors. And I don't know about you, but I hate the enemy, and I don't want to give Satan any advantage over my life. So in this story, Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians about a man in 1 Corinthians that needed to be forgiven. Um, And now the man that committed the sin in 1 Corinthians wants to come back to the church. The church at 2 Corinthians doesn't want to really bring him back. And Paul writes and said, listen, forgive him. He's repented. He was having, he was immoral. He's repented. Bring him back. Now we need to read. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes, I forgive it in the person of Christ. Look at verse 11. If you highlight in your Bible, get a yellow marker, get a green marker, tag this verse. Lest Satan should get the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Interesting. Verse 10 talks about forgiveness. To whom you forgive, I forgive. If you don't forgive, they're not forgiven. Then he says in verse 11, lest Satan should get the advantage over us. We are not ignorant of his devices. Well, I'm here to say we are. The church is ignorant of his devices because one of his number one devices is to have us wound each other and to have us stay in unforgiveness so he gets the advantage. So those are the three reasons why forgiveness is not an option for us. It's an absolute. Number one, Matthew 18, I don't want to be bound to you. Binding and loosing, Matthew 18, 18. Number two, I don't want to be tormented, which was Matthew 18, 35 and 34. You're turned over to the tormentors. And number three, I do not want Satan ever to have an advantage over my life. So those are the three reasons why. Now, let's take a look at the three reasons. How do we do it? Uh, The first one is found in Luke 17. And if time permits, I'll give a testimony. And I have had to live this message. I didn't read this in anybody's commentary. Uh, God's Holy Spirit has taught me this over the years of serving him and, and wanting to live a life of forgiveness because he's forgiven me for so much. So Luke 17, we're going to read verse 1 to 5. This is point number one. How do we forgive? Luke 17, 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Now we went from if my brother, when my brother, to absolute, it's impossible that you won't get offended. Uh, Woe to those who through they come. Boy, I said that backwards, didn't I? Let me do verse one again. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Better, verse 2. Better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and he cast into the sea, that he would offend one of the little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Here we go with the seven again. If he trespass against thee seven times in one day, and seven times in a day turns and says to thee, I repent, you shall forgive him. What's the text? We're talking about forgiveness and unforgiveness. We're talking about being offended. Now, verse five is another one of those verses that people have stretched out of the book of um, elastics like I've never seen. Then verse five said, the apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. Hmm, very interesting. Jesus isn't teaching here on faith. He's not teaching if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain. What's he teaching? Forgiveness and unforgiveness. 
So what I've learned in my life is the number one thing I do or try to remember when I'm forgiving someone to ask God for to increase my faith to be able to forgive them. I don't forgive them by feelings. I forgive them by faith. In all the years I've been saved, I have never had a, ooh, I just had a forgiveness feeling. Oh, it just overwhelmed me. I just want to forgive, forgive, forgive. I'm still waiting. Not once ever have I had a forgiveness feeling overcome me. But I've chosen by faith to forgive because God tells me to, and I love God, and I don't want Satan to have the advantage. So when it comes to forgiveness, we don't do it by feelings. We do it by faith. You may never feel like forgiving that person. You may never feel like releasing them, but you do it by faith in God and faith because God's forgiven you, you forgive. So number one, we don't do it by feelings. We do it by our faith. Number two, let's go to John 20. John 20, and I'll give you the answer to number two. The second way we forgive is with the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 20, and I'm going to be reading, starting at verse 19. Now, let me give you the backdrop. Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven in John chapter 20. Did I tell you that's where I needed you? Yeah, John 20. And he tells Mary, you know, don't touch me. I have to ascend to my Father and your God. And so he comes back, and uh, this is the last thing he's going to say to the disciples before he ascends into heaven. So if you knew that you had five minutes uh, with your family before you were going to go to heaven, how important would the last thing you say be? So this is the last thing Jesus says before he ascends into heaven to the disciples. Later he talks to Thomas about touching him. But let's look at this. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. When he had showed them his hands, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. He showed them his hands in their side. Oh, okay. Um, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father sent me, even so I send you. Verse 22. John 20, 22. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Look at this. Whose ever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whose ever sins you retain, they're retained. Now, this is very important because it's really one of the last things Jesus does before he ascends into heaven. He gathers the disciples. He appears in the room. He breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Ghost, Araka, the breath of God, the spirit of God, the wind of God. And then he gives them their first assignment. He says, who's ever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. Who's ever sins you don't forgive, they're not forgiven. Now understand, I can't stop you from being forgiven. For, to, let's say you, I sin and you don't forgive me. You're going to stay mad at me. You don't forgive me. All right, we're bound. I'm unforgiven between you and I. But I can go to God and get forgiven. So he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Ghost. Who's ever sins you release, they're released. Who's ever sins you retain, they're retained. We need, when we're in a difficult situation and we have to forgive a painful event, we need to stop and not only ask for God to help us to do it by faith, but we need to pray for the power of the Holy Ghost to breathe in us the ability to release them. So the second way we do it is with the power of the Holy Ghost, not our own selves. And then the third way the third way how to forgive, we're going to go back and then I'm going to share a testimony for a minute of one of the hardest times that I ever, ever had to forgive someone. We're going to go back for a moment to 2 Corinthians 2. We read verse 11, lest Satan get the advantage over us. But now I want to focus on verse 10 for a minute. This is my third reason how. Number one, Luke 17, 5, by faith I release you because by faith I know I'm forgiven. Number two. Um, I forgive by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, breathe in me forgiveness for that person. Breathe into me release for that person. And then number three, we do it. Are you ready? In the person of Jesus or with Jesus. 
back to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10, it says this, and I know the verse pretty well. If there's anything to forgive, I forgive. Um, but I'll read it. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive. I forgive it, King James, in the person of Jesus. Some versions say in the presence of Jesus. Well, where is Jesus? Jesus is inside of me. Jesus is inside of you. So when you get to a place where forgiveness is a really difficult battle, you've asked for faith, you've asked the Holy Spirit to fill you, and you're still not able to release it, you have to ask Jesus to help you forgive them. Now, let me tell you my testimony. Um, my parents in the 70s, after they received Christ, uh, my mom had cancer and my dad suffered a stroke. They were both sick. They died six weeks apart, which was very painful for me as a young woman in 1979. But I have to back up and tell you the hardest person I ever had to forgive to this day. And it was my own brother. What happened is when my mom was so terminal, terminally ill and sick, she was in a great deal of pain. We didn't have hospice in that day. And so they, the doctor gave me vials of morphine. And he said I could just give my mom drops down her throat as often as she needed it until she her spirit went to be with the Lord. And there was some kind of an emergency at home and I had to leave my mother. So I got someone to stay with her. And I went home to take care of my family, my husband, my children. I no sooner walked in the front door and the phone's ringing. And it's my friend crying, saying, come back. Your mother needs you. Come back. Your mother needs you. Now, I had left her with the morphine, so I couldn't understand why my mother needed me. She should have been sedated or medicated and not being in any pain. So I gave my next door neighbor my children, my house key. I drove back to my mother's house only to find my mother screaming in pain. And I said to my friend, get the morphine. You have three bottles. Give her the morphine. Give her the morphine. And she said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't give her the morphine? She said, your brother came and took it. Now, my younger brother, Ronnie, came in, found out there were drugs in the house. He's obviously been in the past a drug addict. He not only took the morphine to get high, but then he took what was left and sold it on the street and left my mother screaming. Well, I called for an ambulance. They got my mom on a stretcher, gave her IV intravenous morphine, took her to the hospital. I put my dad to bed because he was paralyzed in a wheelchair. And I walked out into the kitchen that day many years ago and I said out loud, Jesus, I hate him and I will never forgive him. I can't, I can't forgive him. This is unpardonable, unforgivable, I can't do it. And I didn't know this verse in the Bible. I didn't know many of the verses I'm sharing with you today. But I heard the Holy Spirit say this. Jesus said to me, I can forgive him for you. And then he said this, will you let me? Now, I've got to tell you, that was one of my hardest moments in my adult life. That was my Garden of Gethsemane when tears ran down my face. Not blood, but anger. Tears of anger and rage towards my brother that he would do this to his dying mother. And I heard it again. I can forgive him. And I stood there that day and I remember thinking, I don't want him forgiven. I want him to burn in hell. I want him tormented. I want his, I just want eternity to punish him for what he did. And I heard it again. Jesus said, I can forgive him for you. Will you let me? Thanks be to God that day. I said, yes, I will let you. And in a moment, I had a heart transplant. I don't know how Jesus did it, but he took out the heart of stone and he gave me a tender heart for my brother. And all of a sudden I'm thinking my poor baby brother, Ronnie, what's he going to do when he sobers up and he stops drugging and drinking and he finds out what he's done to his mom. And I stood there that day with a heart transplant that has held to this day. I've never picked back. I've never picked up the unforgiveness or the anger towards my brother. Um, I wish I had more time on the teaching to really talk to you about the miracles in his life and mine, but I was able that I was not able. Jesus in me forgave him for me that day. And when I saw my brother the next time, I had no hatred. I had no anger. I had no unforgiveness. I had no bitterness in my heart towards him. I had a heart of compassion for my brother who would do such a thing to his dying mother. Well, let me bring this around to let you know that years went by. My brother and I reconciled. 
My brother received the Lord as his savior. My brother got filled with the Holy Spirit. He's clean. He's sober. He's serving God in a church today because of the power of forgiveness. So remember why we forgive, because we don't want to be bound to that event. Number two, we don't want to be tormented. Number three, we certainly don't want to give Satan the advantage. How do we do it? Number one, by faith in Jesus and in his word. Number two, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And number three, in the person and presence of Jesus. And um, I know I have to stop, but I just have to tell you real quick, forgiveness will change the enemy's heart. Do you remember the two malefactors that were crucified with Jesus? They both railed on him in Matthew and Mark. But when you get to the gospel of Luke, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. One of the enemies received that forgiveness, turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me. And he said, I tell you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. If you want paradise, you can't live in unforgiveness. That's the land of torment. Let me pray. And then I have one announcement. Please stay with me. Father, right now in Jesus name, for those that are struggling with unforgiveness, for those that have been hurt and wounded, Lord, you tell us forgive lest we, our sins are not forgiven. So we choose in Jesus to forgive. Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Lord, let us not let the enemy have the advantage. We choose to forgive by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus. And I thank you for this truth and how many men and women will be set free, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I just want to make an announcement that this coming Saturday at our church in Pleasantville called Crossroads, I'm teaching on fear of failure. Uh, if you'd like to go on my website at the end of the uh, Monday Mana, my website is listed. You can, I want to make sure it wasn't upside down. You can get uh, information. It's this coming Saturday, 10 to 12. Everything is social distance. We have a thermometer. We have masks. We have hand sanitizers. We have a huge congregation you can sit in. You don't have to sit near anybody. But I think it would do you the world of good to come. That's this coming Saturday, August the 29th, 10 to 12, go on my website. And when you're on the website, if the Lord should move you to sow a seed or help me financially, it would be appreciated. God bless you. I will see you at next Monday's Manor.